First, what are cyanobacteria? Um, I know that this course is fairly heavy on algae, so these are generally called blue-green algae, but they are not eukaryotic like the green algae. Like the green algae, they can perform oxidative photosynthesis, but these are prokaryotes. They are bacteria, so they do not have organelles such as the nucleus. They evolved about 2.8 billion years ago, and at, they are primarily responsible for the oxygen that is in Earth's atmosphere today and in the oxygen that was generated at that time. Uh, they are primary producers for oxygen as well as carbon uh, on our planet. They are extremely diverse, as you can see from just this handful of, of species presented on this slide, uh, in both size and shape. Many can be multicellular, which is something we typically don't think of with bacteria, and a number of them have the capacity for spell cell specialization. So a number of uh, species can differentiate cells to be able to do things such as fix nitrogen or perform other diverse metabolisms. Uh, many cyanobacteria do produce diverse natural products, many of which are of interest to people for pharmaceutical purposes, um, and they are pretty much found everywhere you can go on the planet, from the Arctic to the oceans, rivers, and to soils, from anywhere from deserts to forests uh, to mountains. They are the evolutionary precursors to algae and to plant chloroplasts, and so we are really interested in being able to use these, again, for their ability to grow very rapidly, for their capacity to do multiple metabolisms, uh, and for their ability to convert sunlight into carbon-based high-value products. Many of, those carbon, many of those products have already been produced in cyanobacteria, and here's a figure that describes some of those uh, chemicals that have already been made. Uh, but why in general is it that we're doing genetic engineering in cyanobacteria? Well, first, as scientists, we want to understand how, fro how proteins function in the cell. Uh, so we often do that by knocking out a protein and then asking how is it that the phenotype of the cell changes. We can also add in new functions for our engineering purposes uh, to be able to produce novel proteins or biochemicals, again, many of which are shown here that have already been made. And we can then engineer our cells further to be able to optimize production strains. And we do that often through metabolic engineering, which will be discussed in a future lecture. But where do we start? So the starting material is that we need to know something about the genomes of our cyanobacteria. And fortunately for us, over 130 genomes have been sequenced at this time of just cyanobacteria. And you can see the tree of those sequenced genomes on the bottom figure. Uh, they're quite diverse, and, they, and the color schemes do describe quite different morphologies, filaments, unicellular, uh, etc. The genomes themselves are circular, as most uh, prokaryotic genomes are. They range from relatively simple 1.7 megabase genomes to highly complex 11.6 megabases. Uh, and many can have only a few plasmids or no plasmids up to multiple plasmids. So the diagram up on, uh, the upper diagram uh, is showing the genome of a marine species that has nine associated plasmids uh, in its uh, genome. Many are able to acquire DNA from the environment through a process called transformation or from other microbes through a process called conjugation, uh, or from viral infection. And this adds to their genomic complexity as well as to the distribution of the, that genomic complexity across species in the environment. So how is it that we can use these systems, and what do we use these what do we do to, to manipulate these systems? So most often we are generating DNA outside of the cyanobacteria, either in vitro in a test tube or uh, in other species like E. coli and yeast, to specifically manipulate our cyanobacteria to again either knock out, alter by base change, or uh, insert novel uh, DNA to be able to do something of value for us. So in figure A, what we, what we can do is introduce the DNA through transformation or conjugation, as described in the previous slide. Uh, and then we take advantage of, most often, the native homo double homologous recombination system that's present in most cyanobacteria to be able to replace a genetic element uh, using upstream and downstream sequences, the US and the DS in figure A, to be able to recombine out part of the genome. And then we apply selection mechanisms for a selection marker, the SM in part A, which is most often an antibiotic resistance marker, uh, to be able to then segregate. Um, the reason we have to do segregation is because most often cyanobacteria are polyploid, meaning they have multiple copies of the genome within a single cell, and so we need all copies to change over to what we want them to be instead of just leaving a few behind. Uh, another concern that we often think about is double versus single recombination. Double is, would be as in figure A where we complete re completely replace the DNA, single being the whole vector goes in, uh, and we're not really taking out or replacing anything. 
There are other systems to be able to manipulate the cell uh, using counter selection markers, recombinase vectors. There are also CRISPR systems to be able to, to either use as a counter selection system or to make specific mutations at desired locations. And all those tools have been developed over the past 35 years uh, through quite a lot of research and investigation. Um, Finally, we have similar methods. Again, we use these same similar methods to either generate knockouts or overexpressions. And the final way in which we can manipulate it in part C of that uh, left panel is simply to put in a plasmid that is able to replicate within the cell. And these kinds of manipulations can uh, generate cells that are now able to express, for example, an exogenous protein such as YFP, which allows the, the cell to fluoresce under certain uh, conditions in light in, in, a, in a microscope. Now, those systems have been primarily developed for our model cyanobacterial systems. Uh, species such as Synecococcus elongatus, Seneca cystis, or Anabina uh, have all been studied and manipulated uh, for quite a number of decades. But now very, very many people are interested in finding new species and manipulating those. And so broad-based cyanobacterial genetic tools have been developed both here at UCSD and abroad to be able to try and do that. And we've taken, tried to take quite a lot of lessons from synthetic biology by creating parts that can be combined in a standardized method, which is what's being shown in the top figure, uh, to generate vectors that are able to now, in a, in a modular fashion, be used to manipulate these kinds of cells. And we've demonstrated that by, able, by producing, for instance, uh, systems that have cyanobacterial replicating elements, that we're able to create plasmids that can go into quite a lot of quite a number of different diverse species, as is shown on the bottom, where a plasmid is introduced to express CFP in four com very different uh, cyanobacterial species. But oftentimes, something that we have to think about is why these tools aren't universal. So for example, a reason that they may not be universal is that the GC content of the genomes are quite different, and thus the codon usage of these genomes are quite different. Cyanobacterial genomes can range from 31 up to 69% GC, which is a very large range to, be, to have to work in and to be able to uh, encode proteins in the DNA. As well, there are often genetically encoded defenses against exterior DNA, against exogenous DNA, things that the cell would otherwise think are viruses or some other uh, pa parasitic pieces of DNA. So restriction enzymes, DNA methylation, native CRISPR-Cas systems, and transposase inhibitors all can become uh, deleterious to our efforts to be able to transform and manipulate cyanobacteria. What else do we need to consider? We need to consider what cyanobacterial gene structures are to be able to create our, our plasmids and our vectors correctly. So pro, it, it's a basic prokaryotic gene structure. Uh, there is a promoter system that controls the start of transcription. Uh, there are regulation elements, both before and after it, in terms of operators, riboswitches, uh, ribosome binding sites, which can further control transcription or translation. An open reading frame, which it's extremely rare to have introns. They sometimes do exist in cyanobacteria. Um, and finally, a terminator, which will stop uh, the message. Often in cyanobacteria, the messages are polycitronic, meaning we have operons of multiple open reading frames all being uh, transcribed, made into proteins, from the same transcript that has been made into RNA from DNA uh, by RNA polymerase. Now this is species specific, so some species have lots of operons and some species are a little bit more shuffled than others and don't quite have as many operons. So these are again things that we need to consider when manipulating our cells. Finally, genetic engineering with large insertions, anything over 10 KB can be a little bit more technically challenging, but there are ways of trying to get that uh, to be done and, and there are successes in the literature. So finally, how do we do heterologous protein expression? Um, we ideally want to be able to optimize our protein expression, and in cyanobacteria it's been uh, demonstrated, whether explicitly in the literature or, or uh, anecdotally, uh, that um, sometimes extremely high protein expression is not the ideal, that those proteins will then start to aggregate and accumulate. So we do need to try and fine tune our expression system either through a library of promoters, library of ribosome binding sequences, or through characterized parts that people have generated uh, through building block uh, systems or through the cyanovector system produced here at UCSD. So altogether, these can be screened and evaluated uh, to be able to create the optimal expression conditions. Uh, and of course, whether or not you, the scientist or engineer desires those conditions to be controllable under specific conditions. There are promoters that respond to light, to metals, to sugars, uh, so all of these things can be controlled. We also have a number of reporter genes that we can use <coughs> in our systems uh, to be able to um, evaluate promoter systems such as fluorescence with GFP, bioluminescence, or chromogenic systems. <coughs> 
All that is to say is we can do something pretty special uh, when we acquire a promoter that is, for example, heterosis specific. It's only <coughs> expressed in cells of anabina that are fixing nitrogen. And that's what you see in the picture on the bottom.